Welcome to Anti-Tank Chats. In this series, we will take you through the history of infantry anti-tank weapons. My name's Stuart Wheeler. I'm the Tank Museum's Archive and Supporting Collections Manager, and it's my job to look after this extraordinary collection of anti-tank weaponry. I'll be showing you everything from the very first anti-tank rifle through to the latest generation of guided anti-tank weaponry. In this episode, I'll introduce you to the very beginnings of anti-tank weapons in the First World War. This is where the history of anti-tank warfare starts with this gun. This is a 7.7 centimetre 96 NA Krupp gun. This was the gun that would have been available to the artillery regiments of the German army on September the 15th, 1916 at the Battle of Fleurs Corselet. The German infantry was confronted with tanks for the first time, never seen anything like it. They didn't really have any, any major weapons that they could actually um, engage the tanks with. So it befell to artillery units who were in positions with their batteries. These are six or four gun batteries at the time. And they would have started engaging targets moving towards them. They didn't panic. They used their um, knowledge and skills in, in field artillery to engage the targets. And so when the tanks first appear on the battlefield, there is a weapon already there to actually engage them. At uh, Fletcriere Ridge, to the Battle of Combray itself, D and E battalions were coming across batteries of these guns and they were getting engaged by them. Um, D battalion lost 10 tanks and E battalion lost 18 tanks. These were your primary anti-tank assets as the German military. And they had been training their field artillery units to hit moving targets that looked like tanks. This wasn't an accident. They'd been training very hard and they were very, very competent in what they were doing. So if you were a tank unit, you were coming out of the mist, you presented a silhouetted target to these guns and they would have engaged you and generally knocked you out. So if we move on, this actual gun itself was captured at Graincourt at the Battle of Combray in November 1917. It was captured by Albert Baker, who was part of um, G Battalion. He was in tank Gorgonzola. This battery had already engaged seven of the um, battalion's tanks and had knocked six of them out. He was watching to see where the actual guns were firing from, spotted them and was able to outflank them and start shooting at them. For this, he won um, an MC and his gunner, Phillips, won an MM. This becomes a war trophy. And it's this source of, of pride in capturing something so significant that can knock tanks out um, with the ferocity that, with, that they had seen at, uh, at Fleur, throughout the campaigns in the Somme, and during the battles of 1917 that meant that this was such a prized possession. So the capture of this gun became part of tank corps law. So if we move on to the actual um, gun itself in terms of technical details, so designed in um, 1896 by Krupp, modified in 1905-1906, we have um, the 77 centimetre, 32 uh, rifled barrel here. We have a gun that weighs just over 1,000 kilograms. It would have a five-man crew, and it's got a 1.6 centimetre shield on it, um, which would give you um, a little bit of protection. This would be able to engage targets at about 9,000 metres away. It can elevate by about 16 degrees, depressed by 12. It can traverse 7 degrees either side. So it's got a capability to start engaging moving targets. But realistically, this, by the time we get to um, the First World War, is starting to show its age in terms of its artillery use. So they start looking to put it on, on other platforms like the 10.5-centimetre um, howitzer carriage and wheels to give it more elevation. But in its flat trajectory role, as an anti-tank weapon, this is very good at its job. And what starts happening is they start producing anti-tank ammunition as well as HE shells like this one. This is a 6.85-kilogram um, HE shell. They'll also produce shrapnel shells and um, the anti-tank round that comes in later, that can penetrate 40 millimetres of armour at 2,000 metres. So their capabilities are increasing all the time. So you'd have been given 36 rounds of this with your gun limber. You'd have had a team of six horses pulling you. This meant that if you were being counter-battery fired, you could move the guns. There would have been about 5,000 and 
96 of these guns at the start of the war. The Germans looked to improve it, as we stated with the 10.5 centimetre um, howitzer with the wheels, but they also lengthened the gun and that gave it a much better um, armour piercing capability. What we're seeing though is that most of the time when they're engaging the tanks, this will overmatch the armour. Um, so the Mark 1s and the Mark 4s, the Mark 5s, you're looking at about 10, 12 millimetres worth of, of, of armour. This will overmatch it and you are going to actually knock the tanks out without too much trouble, even with the HE rounds. That round will do enough damage really to knock the tank out. We also see the flak wagons, um, we see the, um, the Krupp flat, uh, Daimler flak wagon, light truck, and that's got a 7.7 centimetre flak gun on it, and that engage, allows it to engage um, targets, air targets, as well as um, tank targets on a wheel platform, so it's about to move about the battlefield. They built 156 of these, these weapons. The other thing that the infantry would have had at its disposal is the Minenwerfer. Now, this was a um, 7.6 centimetre mortar that was on a little um, traversable um, table. It had a set of wheels, two, to man, two man, four man crew to move it around, but it had the ability to fire horizontally. So normally you have the steep firing of, of a mortar, steep angle firing of a mortar. This allowed it with the trail wheels on it to fire almost to the horizontal. And it's this type of weapon with a, with a 4.6 kilogram um, round, firing at between 77 and 121 meters per second. Compare that with the 465 meters per second that you'd be getting from your artillery, and you can see how slow that was going towards the, the tanks themselves. The Germans don't stop there. They use their um, 3.7 centimetre gun. They start developing an anti-tank round for that, and that comes out in the late period of the war. So we're looking at the summer months of 1918 and it starts arriving with the troops just around about November 1918 so 600 have been produced so it's a little bit too late for the troops to actually use them but they would have been handed on to the, um, the mortar companies and been used by them to engage the tanks as they're coming through. Now we're going to move on to looking at the development of infantry anti-tank weapons and how they provided the infantry with a means to defend themselves. So this is the MG08. This has the capability to fire 450 to 500 rounds a minute. It would have been given to the um, stormtrooper um, soldiers of the German army and would have been equipping them in 16, 17 and 18. The reason why we have that here is the Germans had developed um, what they called the SMK bullet in 1915 and this was designed really for their snipers at first. This was designed to defeat the armour that snipers were wearing. They were having face shields and body armour to protect them on the battlefield so they could snipe safely. So the Germans came up with a steel cord 7.92 millimetre round that they could use and issue to their snipers and marksmen. So that would be able to defeat 4.5 millimetres worth of armour. So they already had an anti-armour bullet available to them. So when the tanks start coming in in 1916 and 1917, the Germans start producing far more of this ammunition and they start equipping their MG08 units and their uh, Maxim uh, machine gun units with these rounds. Um, so this, this cord round is really what you're seeing on the actual battlefield as the first anti-armour round that the Germans have in their infantry. So your machine guns have a, a limited capability to actually engage armoured targets and they will be issuing these as a special ammunition um, round to the, to the actual um, the MG08 crews. Another German anti-tank weapon that was in the German inventory to begin with was the, um, the stick grenade. So what we have here is the um, concentrated charge replica this would be one of their um, stick grenades surrounded by six other charges. So roughly 270 grams per steel head of these grenades were all put together so you'd get 1.9 kilograms worth of explosive. This is a tow light explosive and the idea was that you would actually be able to throw this or lob it underneath the bottom of the tank. That was the idea rather than on top. Now the weight of this would be about 5.74 kilograms when you're throwing it, so it's quite hefty, and you'd need to probably expose yourself to be able to throw it. But these would be used to basically try and destroy the tracks, try and destroy the um, plates underneath. 
and that concentrated charge would do a lot of damage. So we've seen the types of improvised anti-tank weapons that the German infantry were able to use. But in October of 1917, on the 12th of October 1917, the GPK, the German Gun Testing Commission, issued an order to have a weapon developed that was 13mm or 15mm. Now this went out basically to um, Mauser. They go with a 13mm and approach a firm called Polter who are making manufacturing ammunition. They decide to upgun the standard Mauser and the result is this, the t gewehr or tank gewehr. The ammunition is a 13.2mm round and what you have is a hardened steel bullet inside here. So we have a round that is 116 grams, the bullet weighs 52 grams, and half of that weight is the steel core. This is really about putting velocity into an anti-tank bullet. So this is designed to penetrate 25 millimetres worth of armour at 250 metres. That was the aim. Now the Germans in, on the 10th of January 1918 actually produced this bullet and the gun and they are able to commence firing trials at that point. And on the 19th of January, they are able to present the German War Ministry with a prototype rifle. That's four months since they were initially asked to do it. So in effect, you're getting an urgent operational requirement for the German army to have a specifically designed anti-tank rifle that can engage the tanks. So what we've got here is a, a rifle that is 1.7 metres long, weighs 16.3 kilograms. It's got a bipod here. The first 300 of these um, guns would have been, had a shorter barrel, but this is the L77. This is about 983 millimetres long barrel. It's a bolt action rifle, very simple. You put the round inside here and basically put it in like that. Now on here as well, we've got a sight that is, is graded to 500 meters in 100 meter increments. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to look between that sweet spot between 200 meters to 300 meters. Now, one of the basic problems that they've had with this gun is the recoil factor. You've expanded the propellant in here to over four times what you'd normally have from the 7.9 to um, Mauser round. So you've got a lot more recoil force going. And this was um, studied in, in the 1920s and they saw that this gun would actually produce five and a half times the recoil of the um, Lee Enfield SMLE that the British had. So you can see it's got quite a lot of recoil. So there is a lot of griping um, and consternation and some humour with the Germans about this, what they called the elephant gun, and its ability to actually injure yourself. So they were looking to use larger German soldiers if they could. They were looking to fire at prone positions, really to sort of give yourself a chance to actually not get too damaged by this gun. They did look to improve this version, give it a magazine, and also give it a recoil um, protection at the back in the butt, but that appeared too late for the war. What you would have is a two-man crew operating this gun as well. So you'd have the, the, the first gunner, he would have 20 of these rounds, he would also have a toolkit to actually keep the, the gun going. His, uh, his assistant gunner, his number two, would basically be carrying 112 rounds of this, which would be about 13 kilograms in weight. He would be carrying those into battle, he would be his assistant, he'd be observing what's going on in the battlefield, and he would also be basically um, providing security here. In terms of numbers, we're looking at about 14,700 of these um, anti-tank rifles being produced uh, by the war's end, and they were still producing after the war, and almost another 1,500 were produced. So there were a lot of these anti-tank rifles out there what you would have is this would start to be supplied to units um, in, the, in the German army. From March uh, 1918, what they would like to do is produce 30,000 of them. They don't get near that. What they start to do is up the actual production numbers to about 100 a day in August of 1918. They have first appear against the, um, the French with their Schneiders and their applique armour, and then against the British. And at the Battle of Hamel, where the British were supporting the um, Australians, we start to see anti-tank rifles being used against um, 8th Battalion and 13th Battalion. Um, and what we start seeing is that the, 
the actual um, tanks themselves are surprised by these rounds penetrating through the armour. Um, what they see is you get the after action reports on the history cards, on the history sheets, and basically saying that they're finding these little um, pieces of, of a bullets appearing actually in their, um, inside their tanks. So these, these anti-tank rifles have a bullet that is capable of penetrating the armour. What the problem is, is that it's, it's that 26 grams worth of, of, of bullet can only do certain amount of damage. So you've got to hit the crew. So what we start seeing, in, and especially in August 1918, is the Germans really emphasising the training and emphasising where, with their anti-tank rifles, with their machine guns, with their um, SMK bullets, where they should be aiming on the tanks to actually knock them out. So here with the Whippet, we'd be looking to aim at the vision slots for the um, driver and for the, um, the gunners. So the British response was to paint false vision slots on the armour to confuse the Germans and protect the crew. We'd be looking to get, hit the fuel tanks. This is the type of thing that they were aiming for. They'd be aiming to incapacitate the crew and immobilise the vehicle. For the British um, and their allies, these were more seen as a nuisance and for the, when they were coming across them, these were the types of trophies that you wanted. These were captured, brought back, um, and became unit sort of souvenirs. For the German soldier using it though, this would have been at least something that they could use to, use to actually um, hit back at the tanks. If you could hold your nerve as the tank comes rumbling towards you and start aiming at those vision slots, at the drivers, at, at the gunners, then you can start to disable that. And we start seeing that post the Battle of Amiens in August and September and October of 1918, these become part of their anti-tank defences. These become the type of weapons that if you can engage more than one on a target, they are going to become more than a nuisance. And there are definitely um, occasions where you see tank crews reporting numerous casualties in their crews because of these anti-tank weapons in those, that period of, the, of, of August, September and October of 1918 as the war starts. Um, being brought to the Germans and as the mobility restored to the battlefield, these are the types of weapons that they can start to engage with. In the next episode, we move on to the Second World War and the German Army's anti-tank response to changing tank technology with a Panzerbusch 39. If you're interested in the First World War and the anti-tank subject matter, have a look at our online shop. We've got a number of books that cover these issues including here Steve DeLoga's book on the anti-tank rifle, uh, amazing a weapon that's obviously still pertinent to this day. Um, we've got our tank centenary book, which follows a number of characters who served in tanks in World War I, including Albert Baker, who captures a grain core gun. And again, have a look, we've got DVDs on subjects like this one's a nine box set on First World War issues. Um, so take a look there because we've a plethora of things that you can buy that will inform you about the First World War, a subject very close to our hearts here. There is a wide range of other tank and military history related items in the museum's online shop. We have a fantastic selection of books, models, clothes and other gifts. Don't forget that buying from our online shop supports the Tank Museum charity and means we can carry on caring for our collection and producing this content. If you have supported us already, thank you very much, subscribe and do keep watching.